Actually, good afternoon. Um, I'm Kim Hurtado from Hurtado SC. Um, I'm a lawyer that practices construction law, and I worked with the MBA in developing revisions to the home building specifications. This is for new construction. It can be used also for remodeling, but it was primarily intended to be a document for new home construction. We're going to be talking today about specifications, which you know, some people think, oh, this is uh, uh, a dry, boring issue, and if I just fill in some blanks, I'm going to be fine. The reality is that this is one of the most important documents that you work on in developing a contract with a homeowner, particularly in this day and age, in a tight market where you've got... Um, you might go through five, six, seven, eight, ten different iterations of design before you finally get to the house. And so what you're doing is memorializing and creating a shared understanding of what you're getting for your contract price. And so the time that you take and spend on this with the owner and the way you complete it can do a lot to shield you from further liability and also be your best ally when the owner wants to make changes that have a cost impact so that you don't end up volunteering things because perhaps your specifications are vague. Now, in general, I tell my clients that the standard you want to write to is not what a builder knows about construction using builder words. You want to write to the standard that a, a reasonably bright seventh grader could understand. Now, why do I pick seventh grade? They measured the standard intelligence of a Milwaukee County juror. And that's what it is. <laughs> and so that's the person who has the potential to review your document. Now, you know, you laugh and you go, oh, that's, that's quite a low bar to get over. But that, you know, the point is that words are hard to articulate sometimes. I mean, if you're using a particular brand name or if you're using uh, something that is, uh, uh, if I say T and G, there's nobody in this room that doesn't know I mean tongue and groove, and I'm probably talking about some flooring. Right? But is the standard, is the, as an owner, going to necessarily know that? No. And so you're, part, of your, part of your job as you enter into a contract with an owner is to help them understand what it is they're getting for their money and use words and not abbreviations so that they can get to that knowledge. So it starts out with, standard information in that first paragraph. And I'd urge you during this presentation, grab a pen or pencil, mark this up for yourself. Use this as sort of your template. If you know you like doing a certain kind of building foundation, that sort of thing, um, you might have a custom set of those provisions worked out because you always do a poured foundation. That's just what you do. So the, the provisions on CMU, they're not going to mean beans to, to you. And you don't need them. That's perfectly fine. Um, but you do want to identify a date of plans, where the project is located, get the right project owner's name. And these specifications have the same buzzwords, the same defined words as in the home construction contract we talked about earlier today. So if you use this, it's designed to be, it's designed to mesh perfectly with the Metropolitan Builders Association contract. If you're using a custom contract or AIA, consensus docs, any of the other construction forms that are available in the industry, you want to be really careful. AIA, for example, instead of calling it the buyer, calls it the owner. And so you'd have this mismatch of terms that you need to clarify and tidy up. Um, the, the general section is, has some new features to it. And if you've been using the specs for a while from MBA, what I'd like to do is just let you know what's new. 
It starts out by saying that if, the, if there's a capitalized term, if it's a defined term that's capitalized, and the definition isn't in this document, it's in that building, con that home construction contract for the MBA. So that means if you're going to tear this away and put it to your custom contract, that you're going to have to figure out how to define these terms. You can't, you can't assume um, the, the meaning of the words it, for a different instrument. So you just got to be careful about how you pair stuff up. And then it, it reiterates a concept from the MBA construction contract that the work in the specs is included in the base price unless it's an allowance. Now you will find in this version that we've stripped a lot of the allowances out that are already in the home builder's contract. That, that, so that there's not a duplication and a potential that in one document it says one thing and in, another con in the other contract document in the specifications it says something different. So all the site allowance and selection allowance items in the MBA contract are in that contract document. All the other things that are unique allowances, uh, site falls in. You'll see, we'll see as we go through this. Um, those are in this document only. They're not in both places anymore. That's a change from how this document was last drafted. Um, the specifications tell the home buyer that they describe labor and materials that are selected for their house. And they say something that's really important for most people. Where a specific manufacturer or supplier of materials is listed in the specs, the builder may substitute another manufacturer's or supplier's material of equal or better quality and performance. How many times have you, uh, you know, the one can light that's specified isn't available and you got to get another six inch can and you know that the functional performance of this one and that one is roughly the same, but the owner feels like they've been cheated because they didn't get the brand name they were expecting. Part of your job as you review the specifications is to set an expectation, set a standard that says, I have the right to substitute. I'll give you the same quality. I'll get you something that will, you know, if it was a 20-year roof, you'll get a 20-year roof. It'll be within the same color range. But I might, if I can't get, if I can't get certainty, their factory's closed, it blew up at the, you know, whatever reason, I can substitute something of equal quality and that's still compliance with this contract. I haven't breached the contract. The other thing that it says is that the work that's furnished will meet the MBA standards. Now, I know all of you got today as part of your seminar materials a copy of the performance industry standards. I want to suggest to you that at the time you go through these specifications with the owner when you're about ready to sign, that you give them a copy of the specifications. Either that at that point or when you're doing your closeout as part of your warranty and say, this is what we build to. These, you know, if, it's, if the thing says, if it's out of, if it's out of uh, alignment by a sixteenth of an inch, I'll come in and repair. You, you have my word that I follow these guidelines. And then what you're doing is giving them something so that they understand that they're working with natural materials. And, and those materials are going to perform in the environment that they're in. You're going to see a hairline crack in concrete from time to time. You're going to see wood move a little bit um, if it's very dry in winter or very wet in summer. And those things are not a failure to conform to plan and spec. Getting them to have that understanding, particularly people who are, um, they're deeply invested in their house. The house becomes almost a physical extension of themselves. You'll get that sense very early on as they start making selections. I think for them it's very hard because they know in their mind what they want and you have to have a good read of that sort of person and be prepared to either price accordingly to have a much higher level of finish than industry standard 
and just call it out as that. Or to say, you know, I don't know that I can build for you. The, the, the best decision you can make is to recognize you can't build for everybody. And, to, and it's really hard, especially this marketplace. I totally get, I totally get that you need every job that comes to you. But I'll tell you, here's the, me here's the metric I want you to use. Because when I deal with contractors, when they come to me, Within an hour of sitting down with me, they will tell me these words. You know, I had a bad feeling about this owner when we started. I want you never to ignore that feeling, okay? Trust your gut. If you have a bad feeling at the beginning, at the honeymoon, what's it going to be like down the road? You know it doesn't get any sweeter than that. Everybody's and, and at the very beginning is at the best the relationship will be. And it takes a lot of work to undo anything that's harmful at that juncture. So use the specifications and going through that process as your last litmus test of, do I really want to be getting into a contractual relationship with these people? Can I communicate to them in a way they understand? Are their expectations reasonable or are these guys a little looney tunes and maybe I should just like step back and then run you know I, it it will come back to you many times over the first time you build for somebody where you had that bad feeling it will it will make your radar so crisp that you will never do that your, to yourself again but I just I, I trust your gut trust your gut all right now the the Specifications in the general section also say this. In the event the specifications conflict with the plans, specifications govern. Now, some people say, Kim, I do it the exact opposite way. If it's on the plan, that's the governing thing. Then you're going to have to change this paragraph, OK? Just flip the words in the paragraph for how you like to do business. In general, however, most of your manufacturer's brands, your um, details, are going to be in a written document. Now, some people say, I don't even use this. I just put it all on the plans. You know? And I'm like, boy, I hope you have really detail, a lot of detail pages at the back end of your plan set. Because there's so much, so much that's in here that's hard to illustrate. So many selections that are difficult to articulate in a visual presentation, but very easy in a verbal one. So the MBA says specs control over plans. You can modify that if that's how you do business. That also says, in the event the plans, specs, or manufacturer's instructions depict or describe material system or installation that don't conform to minimum requirements of code, code requirements govern. Now at first blush you go, wow, that's putting some big burden on me. But there are two things. First of all, you have to conform to code no matter what. You have to conform to that no matter what. That's your obligation as a builder in this state, or in any state for that matter, is to conform to local codes. But second of all, sometimes you will get an owner who says, I know it says I'm supposed to have a GFI here, but that's expensive, so I want you to do just a regular duplex outlet. And you go, what? No, no, really. It'll be OK. And you know that's wrong. You know they have to have a GFI there, or they're never going to get their occupancy permit. That's a basic thing. You can use this sentence to say, I have to comply to code, and I want you to do that. I want you to use this and, and, and say, I only want to build a house for you that has, that's, that, that's safe to the minimum code requirements. That protects you and me. If somebody, if, 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 you, if you put that outlet in and somebody gets injured, you know, there's, you know it's, uh, if there's a GFI, it's near water, right? And so if somebody gets injured, you are per se, you are automatically negligent. 
You bought yourself liability just like that. And so you have to educate your owner that, no, you know, I know you want to try and save money. This isn't the place. Let's look for some other areas of savings that we can look for, but not compromise on your safety ever. I would hate for you to be hurt in a house. I don't know. That would just be the worst thing that could happen is for you to be injured in this house. I, I, you know, I, it just is a baseline I won't deviate from. And you set that as a benchmark. You set that as a benchmark for your own safety's sake. It also says, and this is a really important provision, any verbal representation of builder's agents or items listed in sales brochures, etc., are not a binding part of the contract unless they're specifically included or depicted in the contract plans and specifications. Now, if you're building totally custom houses one at a time from architect design plans and specs, that's probably not so much use to you. But if you have somebody walk through your model at the Parade of Homes and they see a particular feature, they think they're getting that feature if they buy that model. And this is, or they'll see something on your website or in a brochure and say, oh, I thought that came standard. You say, no, if it's in here, you get it. If it's not here, it's not included in the contract price. It's just real simple. So if you want it, we can, of course, have it for you. Let's add it to these specifications. If there's anything you saw in my model that you want to see here, let's get it in. Let's make sure it's in there. And I'll make sure to write it up for you. And then there's no disappointment. There's no um, surprise. They're not digging out their visa card paying for extras that they can't afford until they max out the limit, and then you get to be, you know, getting paid 100 bucks a month till the cows come home, or whatever arrangement it is that they end up doing to try and pay for you and have this feature be there. The excavation, the, the specifications start with excavation, and the sequence of them is intended to be the sequence that you'd actually construct the house. And if you think about the specifications, to have them tell them to think about the specifications as being like the skeleton of the project, that I'm going to take you through each of the pieces as though in our minds we were building this house. That's a good way to get them engaged and to be thinking about, well, what does it really look like? One of the hardest things. I think one of the hardest things is that people have a house in their mind, and that's what they want you to build. And they don't, they, the words don't come out of their mouths all the time. And you have to get smart and draw them out by talking about it and by using words they understand. In excavation, the important part for them to understand is that you don't know sometimes until you dig into the ground exactly what you've got. You make some assumptions based on your knowledge you've built in a particular jurisdiction before, and you know in Mequon you've got water problems. You know every one of those places is going to have to have certain things to deal with the, that high iron content in their water, and that you've got water that comes through sites in very weird ways. You can make some provision for that. You can make a bigger allowance in the building construction contract. But you need to explain when you get to this paragraph that if there's something beyond what you plan for. I planned to dig nine feet down for your basement. If I have to dig further to hit bearing ground or I have to do something to retain and get water out of your foundations, Above and beyond my ordinary process, that's an extra to the contract, just so that you know. And then the owner's expectation is set that way. Um, erosion and sediment control, you're governed by, by state and local law. And those, and those regs um, in Wisconsin are getting more and more challenging, I have to say. It used to be you could kind of plunk up a little silt fence, and away you'd go. And not so anymore. You know? and, and local inspectors are getting more and more meticulous about it. 
What this says is you will conform to those requirements. So if your inspector comes out and says, hey, I want this silt vent buried, don't even bother coming, you know, don't, don't stick a shovel in the ground until you do. Fine, that's your monkey. That's your monkey. For backfill and grading, there's a blank that you need to fill in, in paragraph two. And it makes you the authority of placement of the home. Now, if you have somebody who says, I want the home as located on this survey. I'm going to give you a CSM and I want, and I want it, I will pay for stakeout and I will uh, pay for research after you get your foundation dug that it's to exactly where I want it because I want it in one specific spot because I want a vista view of Lake Mendota or whatever it is that they're, you know, that they're uh, working with. Um, then fine, you would change that first sentence. So it says that you will conform specifically to that requirement. Otherwise, you're the authority for placement of the home and where that excavation is going to be. And then it says you'll include up to blank inches of gravel for fill under the garage slab. You know, put in 12 inches, put in what you need based on, on the locality and the soil and what it is you're looking at at the site. The rough grade and other site allowances are in the contract. Now, this is different. This is new in this version of the MBA's building specifications. It used to be there are a bunch, uh, all the site allowances were reiterated here. And what we found over and over again at the MBA arbitration is that people would put one thing in the contract and the specifications would get prepared at a different time and it'd be different. And so now you bought an apple orange. And what did, what did the homeowner expect? Always the more elaborate, more expensive thing. And then you signed on to that. Um, in paragraph three, footings and foundation. I think here, the, the concept that a house has a drain system around it is something that homeowners really don't understand. And so you can talk them through a basic drain tile and bleeder system. You have to kind of gauge their interest and their need for that information. But whatever you put in, in terms of your drain system, you want to not use abbreviations. You want to um, include sizes of pipe if it's pertinent. Um, dimensions, I think, are useful. If you're going to have so many feet of, of stone versus backfill, I think it's important to say that in, in this specification. Foundation walls are an area B of, of, of paragraph three. Foundation walls are an area that I would spend a fair amount of time with. Uh, the typical homeowner has no idea what CMU stands for. And in their mind, they may think that's what a foundation looks like and they have no idea what a poured foundation even looks like. It may be either you can have them see a model or a picture and take a look at the two of them and then explain that the two have very different construction sequences and very different um, abilities to perform. And make sure they understand so they're making an informed choice of what they do for their basement walls, their foundation walls. Again, uh, you know, uh, you can say waterproofing per code. But what does the homeowner understand that to mean? You know, uh, you're going to use a single sheet of tar and some rigid, rigid insulation would be better. That would be more helpful because then the, a two-inch rigid insulation will be applied over that waterproofing material that'll be mop applied or whatever it is, it, then their expectation is set. They know what it is they're getting. Per code doesn't tell them anything. And here's the other thing. Um, sometimes on really complex projects, code at the time you sign the contract isn't code at the time you start building, isn't code when you finish the project. On some of these big monster houses that you see today, that can be a real issue. So you tell them, this 
When, I, when this thing says code, it means code on the day we sign the contract. And then it's up to you to adjust if you've had this gap in time to true it up right before you sign that contract, okay? Columns and girders per plan and code requirements. Here, here I would take the plan out and show them an example of a column. Show them a, an example of a girder. So they know in real life what those things are. You'll construct them as they appear on the plan. And this is an important thing. I can't tell you how many cases come to the MBA because there's a column right where I wanted to put my pool table. And you say, but it was on the plan. <laughs> it was right there. They said, there's a little circle there. What is that? I don't know what a circle is. You have to explain that. And so you need to explore a little bit. Do you need a clear span someplace? I can make that happen. We can put something beefier up above and structurally carry the load. That's not a problem. I just need to, I need you to understand you're not going to have, it's, it, it, it can be this room or it's going to have some columns in it. That's the important part on foundations for our residential construction. Flat work, flat work. Um, basement and garage floors. Here's where it's awfully nice to um, use the Metropolitan Builders Association Industry Quality Handbook. You have this nice little set of paragraphs that are the introduction to that section on flat work that talk about the reality that, you know, as concrete cures, you can get hairline cracks in it. You can put it, you, you know, you're going to put control joints in, and you're going to work to minimize that, but you might not entirely um, avoid that. Bless you. Uh, and so you set that as an expectation. Now you say, if you start seeing a deviation from one side of the crack to the other, and it goes more than a sixteenth of an inch, if it opens up more than a sixteenth of an inch, that's the MBA standard, then we've got issues, and I want to know about it right away. You see that, and I haven't managed to call it. I'll probably catch it before you. Then we've got an issue that we need to deal with. So what are you doing? You're setting expectation through the specification process. Um, stoops and steps. Um, if you've got poured concrete, again, you're, you're going to be talking about if you've got a gravel base, if you've got um, formwork, railings, things like that, you might want to, you know, set the foundations for those in here. If you're building um, out of something other than concrete, specify the type of material. Um, better still, make a little picture of it. You know, take a little picture of it. If you're making it out of, uh, you know, a, a decking material, spec the deck material that you're going to use. Uh, give them, you know, that it's, it's screw down instead of uh, nail down um, decking material. In patios and sidewalks, patios and sidewalks I see being an issue because um, uh, it's more patios that become the issue in specifications. And in patios, um, what will happen is that they won't realize how big a particular shape is. It'll say 20 by 30 or whatever the dimension is, and they don't have a real time. You, you know, because you work with measure all day long as part of your day job, you know what that is. If you, you know, if you test and you get the sense that the owner's really not understanding that, lay it out for them. Show them real-time space and say, is this what you want when you give them a dimension? Help them to visualize in a kinesthetic way if you get the sense that they don't know how to read plans and or that they're not really understanding the space requirements so that they're not surprised by the size of the patio when it comes on. And then the other thing about patios, if it's going to be stamped or stained or there's any unique features, you're going to cut some garden beds into the patio deck, uh, make a picture. You know, draw. Give them something and attach it. 
That's an easy way to get to clear understanding. When you've got a unique shape that's being formed or unique, you're going to build up beds. You know, they want some uh, uh, half high raised garden beds in their patio deck or adjacent to it or you've got railings or anything unique. Go ahead and write all of those features in. Don't just give them a dimension and think you're done. Um, exterior and stamped contract, uh, concrete. If it's stained to uniformity, it's not so difficult. But sometimes you get, um, especially these days where you're doing um, sustainable construction, where you're seeing more homeowners go to um, concrete as their slab for passive solar, and then they're staining it. And you can get these stains that do like a mottled cloud effect or sweeps or, you know, same thing with plaster where you have decorative plaster that can be unique shapes and things. Give them a sample to look at that sets the benchmark of quality. And that can be either a sample set that's at your shop or that you make specifically for this project that is the sample of quality, the sample of the standard deviation. If you're going to use a particular, you're going to embed stone or marble or something, let them see exactly what that looks like so that they know when you use the words that say it's going to be stained to a cloud finish, what that means. So it has real time meaning for them. Um, lightweight, lightweight concrete flooring, if you're using gypcrete, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, this is one of the places that has an allowance that doesn't appear in the building construction contract. So you have, that's a very good point. The, so the issue he's raising is there's an allowance here. How did that get transferred into the contract price? Now, if you were in the session this morning, you know that all of the contract price is summarized on the first page, but then there's an exhibit A. And in Exhibit A, there's a group of selections in either site selection or in um, uh, selection allowances or site allowances, either one. You'd add that in one of the blanks and put in the dollar amount so you're not losing the price as part of your contract price. Yeah. I, you know, I really I hesitated leaving any allowances in here at all for fear of exactly what your concern is. that It's not going to get reflected back into your contract price, and the owner gets surprised that they get an extra. Why but, do you do it on this issue? pardon me? There are allowances sprinkled through this whole document. And, and the ones that got left behind in the specification were things that were really pretty unusual. The stuff that is in the contract that are site allowances or selection allowances are much more standard things. Wall color, light fixture, plumbing fixture, for site, culvert, uh, haying of footings, standard things that you would use that are specifically for site allowances. The things that were left in the specification were things that are, not everybody has stained concrete. That's a fairly rare kind of thing to have. And so uh, I wouldn't be troubled if you as a builder took them all out, all the numbers out of here, and just put them in the contract. I think that's a better practice. It, it, that's just me personally. Yeah. Well, I think it's hard to do in cases of tile where it's a material allowance or cases of brick or stone where mm -hmm. they're per ton or per thousand. This one, you could make it a per square foot cost as right. allowance. Right. Right and leave it in here for a material only. Right, just for material. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, there's always that trade-off of where the most clear place to put it is. Uh, and the reason it got put here is that none of the selection allowances and none of the site allowances that are in the contract really deal with concrete flat work. And so the thinking was if we put it as close to 
the, the specification as possible, it'll be helpful to the owner to understand. But I, you know, I, I think a very good case could be made for putting all the allowances, every last one of them, in the contract itself and making sure that those make it into the contract price. All right, we're all the way to the masonry exterior walls. Um, brick size and mortar color. The, the reality is homeowners don't know if you change from king size or from queen size to king size brick, it's not, it's not just a know nothing change. There's real dollars that are tied to that. If you go from standard color mortar to custom color mortar, there's real cost to that. And so we try to color, we try to articulate that where we can. Again, brick is another thing. It's really easy to get a sample of a piece of brick to use as your benchmark and literally show them. This is the palette of things that you're selecting. Um, for exterior stone, again, as, as, as you heard earlier, you're going to be pricing by the ton. And for, for here, I think the important thing and where I've seen some kickback in, uh, in uh, mediation and arbitration is people don't understand when they see stone, when it's veneer and when it's full stone, full course, you know, four inches of stone. You would look at that and you go, come on, you can't tell veneer? But they really can't. And so you're going to have to explain the difference to them in words and or show them the difference and make sure they understand as they put that together. Um, and then for this stuff, you may end up crossing out one or more of these as not being applicable, or this whole section. If you've got a house that has no exterior masonry, foomp, you just cross this section off. And then um, the uh, cleaning and sealing is set up to be an extra. That, again, is your preference. If, you, if that's something that you do as part, a standard part of your house, you're building a high-end house, Fine, you cross that off and you just say that it's included. Um, in fireplaces and chimneys, I think this is another area where it really is awfully, awfully nice to attach some pictures or some specs. Like a, 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 a cut sheet from a manufacturer or some kind of a detailed drawing that lets them see what they're getting. It's very hard for most homeowners. They can see a little rectangle on a, a, a plan set, and they will not have the first clue how big that fireplace really is, how, what the opening really looks like. But if you give them color pictures, or if you give them a detailed drawing, and you give them a hand sample, and it's a lot harder for them to say, this wasn't what I wanted. I didn't get my money's worth. Um, anything, anything that's an aspect of fireplace, I think you see in the specs here. Gas logs, is there a chimney cap? Is there a chimney pot? Um, any kind of specialty mortar and masoning that you want to have done? Any detailing? Sometimes you get um, um, fancy screens because you know you're going to be building in a wooded area and you don't want critters climbing into the fireplace. Uh, you know, whatever it is that you're going to be doing, put it into your specifications. Framing. Um, 7A talks about mud sill. This is another place where you stop and you do a tutorial to the owner who has no clue of what a mud sill is. For all they know, that's the place when they walk into the back room, they scrape their boots off. Okay? Um, Whatever it is and how you construct your mud sill, sometimes this is a good one to show them a cut section. And if you don't happen to have one handy, the Metropolitan Builders Association quality, industry quality standards has a lovely little standard cut section that shows a mud sill that I think is really helpful. It identifies the pieces of the framing a little bit. And I think that's helpful to the owner to explain what you're doing. Um, for flooring and um, framing, um, 
if you're using abbreviations like um, GFI or TIFF or whatever, um, or uh, micro lamb beam, they're not necessarily going to know what those things are. And so you get to a trade off of what you're providing and how much information you give them. Some people won't care and they'll kind of glaze over. They don't want to know what the inside looks like. All they care about is the aesthetic, what it finishes like. Um, again, you can show them hand samples. It's pretty easy to give them a little cut section. But um, that's up to you how much depth you want to go into. But I think it's important if you're using OSB, you know and I know that that's going to perform a little bit differently than a full AC sheet apply. You know, and so they're getting what they pay for. And you can use the dialogue about this to have them upgrade the quality of the house, perhaps, and concomitantly change the contract price accordingly. Um, roofing. Roofing tends to be a little bit easier because people can go to like uh, the big box stores and see different kinds of asphalt seal down shingles, cedar shakes, steel raised and aluminum raised uh, metal roofing. And so they have a little bit more familiarity with that, but you, you can't presume that. And so you want to show them, give them a sample of what they're getting. Um, if you've got, this is an area where if you've got warranties for a roof, it's going to be a 25 year roof, it's really nice to have a copy of that warranty right then and there to give them. You'll give it to them again in that closing packet when you do your walkthrough and you teach them how to operate and use the house. But it's awfully nice to say, and you'll be getting a special warranty. This product is warranted for 25 years. Use it as a selling point, but also to start introducing this concept that where there's a product that has a separate manufacturer's warranty, they're going to look to that warranty and not to you and the terms of that warranty in terms of replacement of that product. Fascia soffits, gutters, what is it made of? What, am I, what materials am I using? How wide are the boards? Same thing with siding. Is it going to be finished? Are we going to do, we're going to do cedar siding? Is it going to just be raw? How are we going to deal with knots? If you're not dealing with number one cedar, clear, even if you are, that is an issue. I, for whatever reason, and partly because of the weather in Wisconsin, weather in Wisconsin is not kind to cedar. And it's particularly true because the dimensional lumber you get today is not the same wood that you could get 10 or 20 years ago. Not as nice, not as dimensionally stable. So you've got to talk about what's going to happen if you have a knot. Talk about how you're going to caulk that or chink it or whatever it is you're going to do with that and set it as an expectation when you're using these natural products. It'll save you a lot of grief in the end when they see a knot hole that works its way loose. They know they have the expectation already of how it will be fixed by you or not fixed by you. Ah, exterior doors, millwork, and windows. You may end up taking this and, and just blowing it apart because there's different kinds of doors. And just repeat the section as many times as necessary to identify the doors. Or you can get your sub to write up a set of sheets, attach them on. See, see door schedule. Boom. If you have not yet made this as a selection, the owner's still got to select it. Uh, this is something I didn't talk about when I was talking about the building construction contract, but I, I want to talk about it here. Every time you leave an allowance that is a selection allowance in your contract, you create the potential for conflict. If you have a less sophisticated build, um, homeowner, somebody who's never built before, doesn't really know a lot about construction, 
they are the kind of person where you want to take some time and say, let's not sign this with a bunch of allowances in it. Let's, make this, let's just take a few extra weeks and make the selections. And then we won't have those as allowances. They'll be picked already. You will be a lot happier, and so will the homeowner, on that project. Now, if you've got somebody sophisticated who knows how to read plan set, they've built a house before, you know, you, it, it, you don't have quite that same worry. And if they want to have an allowance for the carpet, and they know what it goes into and when they've got to select it, I'm not so worried about that, and, and, and I'm not so worried about protecting you in that way. But where you've got the young, unsophisticated, unknowledgeable um, owner, take the time. It's, it's, it just comes back to you a hundredfold. Um, with, um, um, with windows, windows are such an area of complexity these days. You know, it's not, your standard double hung isn't standard anymore. Is it triple, triple glazed, low E argon filled? Is it, um, you know, is it insulated sash? Is it, you know, you can, there's two ways to do it. Either you write out those specifications or you have whoever's going to supply your windows give you a summary, window by window, of the, you know, you're getting 12 of this and so many of that. And they say right in there, this one is argon filled, this one is, it's got embedded interior louvers, whatever it is they're selecting. And then make sure that they really, when they go to your sub to select those windows, make sure they see the quality, that they actually see the windows themselves. Um, one of the other big areas that I see litigation in Wisconsin is vinyl windows and vinyl siding. There's a wide range of quality. And they look, there are some that look really good, but they're really not very stable for Wisconsin for the variation in temperature that you're seeing. And so um, make sure they understand that if they buy the cheapest ones, they're going to have the least performance out of those windows and doors. And particularly for vinyl, that vinyl can, it can warp, it can, it can buckle a little bit, and that's within industry standards. Again, this is a place where you want to go back to the quality standards of the industry, that book, and, and have them understand what it is they're getting. Um, that there can be... Uh, between two pieces of vinyl, you might see a seam. That's, that's within industry standards. That's something you want them to understand and make clear so that you're not, they're not surprised by the quality that they get. Um, interior millwork. Uh, again, especially for the colors of interior millwork, the stains, the... Um, the uh, shape, the profile of your trims, boy, a hand sample solves a myriad of problems, doesn't it? They can just see it, they know. Don't say ranch casing if they have no idea what ranch casing is, right? Um, stairs and railings, if you're not doing a straight run 14 steps up, if you're doing something more complicated, you're doing any kind of a curved staircase, boy, I sure like to have pictures. I sure like to have a drawing that you can attach to your specifications. It just makes it so much clearer for the owner. If you don't have a full set of architecturally drawn plans, this is a good thing to have your, whoever's going to do your stair work and your rail work give you something to the, for them to see. If you're going with metal rail work, something that shows them what the finish is. An um, owner doesn't necessarily know what matte finish is. You know. All right. Cabinets and countertops. I think the biggest issue that I see here in the industry is veneer versus solid wood. If you're going to do a veneered product, just say it. 
Say it in your spec. And then there's no question, and you're not going to be 14 months later arguing with them because they thought that your model had full wood cabinetry, and they just never bothered to open up a door to see that it was a veneer. Same thing with hardware. Um, get, them thing, get them the hardware to see. Identify it by the manufacturing number. This is another thing where attaching the cut sheets from your manufacturer or the order numbers from your manufacturer or your supplier right to your contract is a good idea. It tells them exactly what they're getting. Um, the other thing that I think sometimes is um, they don't always know what joinery is. They don't know what a dovetail joint is necessarily unless you show them. So talking about the joinery of the cabinets, and then if there's any custom, like it's a pull-out bin for vegetables, it's, uh, it's got spice racks in it. I don't know why. I don't know why. It's always the spice rack when there's a problem. So if you have a spice rack, just be a little careful to articulate exactly what they're getting. Be, you know, and invariably what it is is they have these bottles that their, their great-grandmother gave them, the antique, and now they don't fit on their spice rack. You know, ask, is there a particular size that we need to make this be? Let's make sure it fits grandma's spice jars. Okay, so you're not disappointed and I give you what you need. I don't know, it's always the spice jars. Um, door and cabinet hardware. Um, same thing, and oh, countertops. There are countertop materials that are solid composite. There are veneered countertop materials. You can have granite. You can have um, uh, pre-finished uh, kinds of materials. This is an area where I really think you want to have hand samples. And you want to make sure that your hand sample is illustrative of the full set of qualities. Make sure it's a big enough sample that they really see the color deviation within a natural material. If you can, better still, take them over to the stone store and let them pick out their slab, pick out their piece so they know what they're getting. Um, in door and cabinet hardware, um, lock sets tend to be the big issue. And keying, don't forget about keying when you talk about your hardware. Is everything going to be keyed to a single set of keys? Or some keys are masters and others only open certain areas? Do you have any special ones like, you know, the homeowner's got teenagers and so there's going to be one cabinet where the liquor's kept or the guns are kept? that has special locks on it. Ask about those things. Do you want that? How do you want it set up? We can make it whatever you want. Tell me what you need. Bathrooms. Where I see bathroom specs being a problem is usually in Whirlpool spas. I don't know. This is like the spice cabinet. I'm not sure why, but there are so many variations and particularly, you know, is it a ceramic? Is it a fiberglass? Owners don't necessarily know, um, or they have a very strong opinion. So better, again, to have, if, if you can have a brochure that's got a color picture of what they're getting, I really like that for whirlpools. Let them see the actual operation. You know, if you can go to your... Um, supplier and see how this works or look at it in a model even better oh I didn't realize the get the jets were only going to be at the bottom and that they couldn't direct up and down I don't like it anymore you've ruined my dream home okay it happens that this is a, this is an area of strong user preference so just make sure that you clearly articulate what it is that they're getting. Carpet. Um, in an effort to market, um, 
you've gone away from square yard pricing and it's it's hard for homeowners if this is an area especially if you use allowances because they might not have the carpet spe, um, selected at the time you uh, decide to use it uh, or your time you fill out your specifications and so um, I would try to stay away from uh, uh, just, just putting a raw number and no other qualifications on it. I would give them, I would say, I built into this allowance a really good way. If like you have a model home and it has a standard carpet in it, say, the, I gave you the pricing for the my model carpet. This is the same grade as my model carpet. And that gives them a basis of comparison. Don't price an allowance for carpet for handy andy indoor outdoor. You know, because you know they're going to be unhappy with that. You know that allowance isn't going to be enough. Try and get a gauge of their desire. Do they want the super plush carpet? with the extra thick padding and give them a real time price for what that's going to be so that they keep enough money in their budget when they go to the lender and ask for money and it's not something that you have to try and finance for them at the end. Um, the other thing is if you've got any specialties um, sometimes in high-end houses now um, <coughs> excuse me you see these um, carpets that have the custom borders. Again, a picture is worth a thousand words. Lay out how the hallway runner is going to tee into the room and the specialty borders are going to be depicted. Make it easy for them to understand what it's going to look like so they don't have a surprise and go, oh, I didn't realize the border would cross here. That looks horrible. I'm so offended. I can't live in my home. I can't sleep at night. You know, it's an easy thing to fix at the front end, and it's expensive at the back end. Um, wood flooring versus uh, pre-finished flooring. Here, I think, especially if they're going to use real wood, it, you know, it, it's worth explaining the wider you get, the less dimensionally stable wood is, and you're going to have to be really careful about how you keep and maintain your house if you want wide plank. Um, you can do it, just be aware that it's going to respond um, with greater variation than a narrower board. Also, a, explain the difference between a quarter sawn and a standard cut board is as easy as showing them some hand samples, showing them the color stain, especially on houses where you're mixing a custom color. It's not, I can't go and get colonial of this brand of stain and know I've got the color match. If you're mixing up a custom batch, make sure they've got that hand sample so that they know exactly what they're getting. They can take that to their interior decorator, get what they want, make your life easy. Um, with pre-finished flooring, again, very easy to get them a hand sample. I like a hand sample better than a, a brochure or a cut sheet for pre-finished floor so that they see what the substrate's made of. They see how thick the topping material is and they know what they're buying. Vinyl floor and sheet goods. Here, the problem isn't going to be, they, they can pick out a pattern or the material that they like. The problem is going to be what the underlayment is and what the read through is. Can you see a seam underneath there of the subfloor? That's always the big issue. And so you want to talk a little bit about if it's the lighter the floor is, the less pattern the floor has, the more you have that potential for a read through. Now I can pour gypcrete for you and you'll never, you won't see a seam at all. But we need to build that into the price, right? 
Um, laminate flooring, interior decorative concrete. Um, same thing as the other concrete. Give them a sample if they're doing anything fancy with the finish on that concrete. And embeds. Show, give them a sample of you're going to, um, on this tile floor, there's going to be a little transition at the, at, from one room to the next that's got a medallion piece laid in. Lay out and show them exactly what that's going to look like. You know, have a picture of that medallion available as part of the hand samples that you're showing them about the project. Hard tile. Um, in this day and age, you can do so much that you couldn't do with tile. Uh, they'll, they'll run a custom color of caulk for you. If you're going to use a custom color of caulk, lay out the caulking, the custom color that you're using, what you're tying it to. Um, with the tile itself, if you have a particularly fussy tile, there's some tiles that are easier to work with others. They cut nice, they're easy, they're simple ceramic. And then you've got these funky hand-blown glass, uh, metal inlay, fancy stuff that is, uh, you know, they want a mosaic. They want something special. They want iron worked into it or steel pieces or something. You're making unusual transitions. Either depict it in your plan set or you're going to have a separate detail sheet that you're going to attach onto this document. Drywall and plaster. This typically is not an area that is such a bad area. Usually, um, if you mud and tape your seams so you're not seeing seams, and you get your corner bead in good, there's not too many problems that you end up with spec. Um, if you are going to do Venetian plaster, there are still some people around who like Venetian plaster, or they want pulled plaster over drywall to give the illusion of a, of a full Venetian plaster. Just articulate what you're getting in the depth of your, of your mud how you're gonna and how you're going to strike it. Um, explain that garages have to have different drywall because you've got a firewall in there. Explain what a firewall is. Explain they have to do it because it's code. And then let, you know, so that they have an expectation there. Plumbing. You will probably spend, uh, plumbing and lighting are where you'll spend the most time making selections and where they'll have the hardest time making selections. You spend an awful lot of time every day in the bathrooms of your house. And so uh, just take the time, let them pick out what they want, and then make sure when they get the whole package together to give them a, if you can, if you can, give them a little time before you freeze that snapshot of what they've made in plumbing selections. Very often, what will happen is you'll make some early selections in plumbing, and they'll see something in a magazine. They'll see or they'll decide they want to upgrade that area, and plumbing invariably gets involved. So give them a little time to get to that and make sure you're getting their final selections in there. And this is an area, too, where they'll go through, if, they're, if, they're, if you've gone through five or six iterations of the house before you get to the final one, it's very easy for them to not know what the numbers mean. So be careful that you're selecting that last set of their stuff. And if you can, make a last run with your sub through all of those selections and let them see what they're selecting. Because you know the SR6742 is a certain shape and color and size. They don't necessarily, that's not meaningful information to them. And so they can sign a contract and not realize they're using the second to last set of spec for plumbing. That happens all the time. And then they're disappointed and you're like, hey, you signed it. I, why didn't you, you know, why didn't you, because they don't know from numbers. They don't know from numbers. Um, bar and for freshman area, laundry are separately broken out just as a convenience so you don't forget to select some hardware you might need. And then miscellaneous plumbing. 
You, in certain jurisdictions, you can't build without water softeners. And certain high-end houses, you don't build without RO and treatment systems. It's just uh, considered standard of the industry. Um, talk about, here's a little issue that gets very frustrating. Talk about where the hose bibs are on the exterior of the house. It makes a difference to people where they can get water. Um, if you're going to have um, uh, any kind of gas jet to uh, a barbecue grill or a lamp or something like that, make sure you're accounting for it here and you're describing it. Or again, do an attachment, a cut sheet to your spec. Electric wiring. This will mean a lot to you and be like, have you ever seen that Far Side cartoon? Um, the Master's going, oh, good dog, Rex. You're just such a great dog. Rex, you're just the best behaved dog. And then the next balloon, what Rex hears? Blah, 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 Rex. Blah, 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 Rex, blah, Rex. Okay? That's a lot of what this feels like to the standard homeowner. Um, what's more important is the number of things. How many refrigerators are there that need to be wired? Are there fans that need to be wired? And you take them, and what I would recommend, the best thing to do is kind of walk them through the house. Walk them in their minds, room by room through the house, get the plan set out, and talk about the electric needs. Talk about, like, have you planned where your furniture is going to be in this room? If you can, in the bedrooms, if you know where the beds are, it makes a big difference of where you put the outlets and help them to plan that a little bit about how they'll use, thinking about how they'll use the space, not just what amenities are in it. Um, security system, vacuum system, sound system, um, increasingly teledata. I want Cat7 wired everywhere. I'm, I want a very techno-savvy house. You might break out what is one line on this form. You might break out to a whole separate section uh, for the techno-savvy contractor. I saw some really fascinating stuff that Corianne is doing. Um, they have glass that um, lays on top of a countertop or on a wall, and you can run teledata through it. You'll be able to, instead of a computer screen, you'll be able to run a picture and see grandma and have sound and uh, move grandma from here to here because I'm putting the eggs here because I'm in my kitchen. The, I think the single biggest thing is the sustainable features and the techno features of houses are going to be the single area where you see the most change. And so you can expect to see this area of the contract need to be something that you'll expand as technology expands. You know, the wiring you do for a house today is quite a bit more extensive than what you would have done even 10 years ago because of technology needs. But what you have to do is be smart enough to ask, um, what kind of computers do you use? What, you know, what do you want for security system? If, you're, if you've got uh, people who only use cell phones, you're not going to want to put foil bat insulation in the basement because they won't be able to use their cell phones in their own basement. And they're not going to be happy with you. So you've got to think about the cross implications in the specifications. And it may be, here's the other thing, as you're going through specifications with the owner, especially the first time you go through, what it may be is you kind of do this dance where you, you work on the low voltage system in paragraph 18 and it kicks you back to insulation earlier in the spec. And you got to bounce back and forth um, and make adjustments as you go to get to that final set. So really what you're doing is this dry run discussion and then the final version that they sign off on. HVAC, another area that can be blah, 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 Rex, as far as your owner is concerned. They don't know from zones. What do you mean zones? And so you have to talk about it in words they understand. 
which is, do you want each room to have its own heating and air conditioning controls? Do you, or can we put groups of rooms together? Ordinarily, I would say this room you want to have in a separate, you know, you know, but what do you want? What do you need? And from their needs, then you help them to derive the HVAC that they need. Um, they throw range hoods and laundry ducts into this part of the HVAC. You might end up dealing with range hood back in the kitchen appliances. It, it, I mean, it, there's different places that you can put these. It's where they happen to, um, the MBA put uh, each of the specs by trade that would be the installing trade contractor. So if you have a homeowner that's not understanding range hood here, fine, move it to where it makes sense to them. Um, insulation. I think the thing that's hardest in insulation is explaining the concept of R value. You, you know, how you, how you think about insulation. Uh, and then giving them some ideas about what they do with insulation in terms of building envelope. And then that also has some ricochet into HVAC, right? Because you make a house too tight, and man, you better use those fans in the bathroom, or you're going to make mold big time. So particularly if you're doing sustainable construction, if you're doing green and you want to be LEED certified, building envelopes is going to make a big difference on whether you're silver certified or platinum certified. You, um, and, and so insulation will be a big piece of how you achieve um, a lot of the point system for your, the rating on your house. Uh, so you, it may be that, that talking about insulation leads you to a much different process of going through the impact on lead certification and then brings you back into insulation and articulating it again. Um, uh, another thing that I see people all the time be concerned about is I don't want the pink stuff. You know, they'll say something like, I don't want the pink stuff. And what they're really telling you is, you know, they're, they're, they're wanting something that is um, um, uh, formaldehyde free or, or it doesn't have uh, 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 chemical or dye or things like that in it. And that sets you down a whole different conversation with them. How green do you need this house to be? You know, what is it that you're really wanting out of the house? I can make you whatever you want. I can make that. I can get, um, I can get fiberglass insulation that has no uh, additional chemicals in it, and it'll work just fine, and it'll have the R value you want. Or we can go to a different product. You know, sometimes you get people not so much interested in green, but very interested because they are allergic. That's an issue you should ask about in specifications. Do you have any kids with allergies? It sometimes comes up in the windows because the window treatments will be something that they can get dust and stuff on, and so they have to have like the louvers built into the windows. Um, or it'll come up in HVAC. I have to have special air filters and cleaners because I've got a kid who's, who's allergic to dust. My husband's allergic to dust. There's all kinds of things I did to my house that I never would have dreamed I needed to have. Um, it's important to um, ask those questions up front because the house you build for somebody who's, who's, um, who's environmentally sensitive is going to be a much different house for them to be happy in their home. Painting and decorating. Sometimes you'll have this, sometimes this will just be to be a determined. See painting allowance. If you got to do that, you got to do that. Um, reference a color name, not just color numbers. If you got a hand sample of the wall covering, make it be a part of your book that you keep. Um, if you are, if you're dealing with unusual products, 
um, unusual finishes for wall covering. For example, um, bamboo. How are you going to seam it? How are you going to seal it if you're going to be sealing it? All those things need to be in your spec when you talk about that finish. Appliances is one of the few areas at, at paragraph 22 where names matter to some customers. And so if they insist on an Amana radar range, say no substitutions. Just say no substitutions if there is none. Otherwise, this spec presumes that you can substitute um, as long as, it's, as it is of comparable quality. But you will find that how the shelves are organized in a refrigerator makes a big difference to some homeowners. And so if you've got a substitute, you want to be plugging back in with that owner and saying, come on over and take a look at this uh, Sears Kenmore. And I want to make sure it's OK before I substitute, because Amana stopped producing our model, and I can't get it for you. OK? And just be a little sensitive to that issue, because then it, that, again, is a performance issue. You know, you know, to you, one refrigerator, the same cubic yards, uh, you know, the same cubic feet of freezer and, and um, refrigerant component is, is the same as the next, not necessarily for them and how it performs. Garage doors. Um, where, you're, where you have uh, products that are seamed, that's where I sometimes see issues in garage doors. Because they'll get a, a seam that opens up and they don't like how it looks. Or, you know, um, the st in standards of the industry is a pretty uh, generous standard for the builder in this regard. But um, where you have a homeowner that's sensitive about that, say, you know, maybe you shouldn't use that material. I think this is an area we should upgrade to a nicer material because I think you'll just be happier in the long run. We'll find another place for cost savings for you. And that line, you know, here, when you're seeing that kickback where the owner has a very specific need, a very specific look they're going for, that's a good way to deal with it. Let's build in higher quality here We'll look for another place for cost savings elsewhere. And then you know that the higher quality product's going to perform better. You know that. I mean, you get what you pay for in this industry. And that way, you're giving them something that they're not disappointed. Walks and driveways, same thing as sidewalks. You know, where are they located? Um, are you going to uh, do a specific kind of base? Are you going to seal the concrete? How are you going to handle the edge treatments? Is it going to be stamped? Is it going to be colored? All of those things need to be articulated in your spec. And then there's a whole section on landscaping. Um, that's because the MBA, as a, as a policy decision, has said that final grading and landscaping is not something that's typically covered in our contract. Somebody else is going to be doing that. And the important thing for the homeowner is to know you can't wait. You can't leave rough grade out there, move in, and just leave it like that. You're not going to be happy with the performance of your house. Water's going to get into that basement. Um, you don't have good positive drainage. It's really a problem. So. Either we can build that into your price, and we'll modify this paragraph accordingly, or I will let you know a couple weeks before I want your landscaper and finish grader to come on out. And we, you know, but you've got to time it so that as you're moving in, these things are done. And you set that expectation right up front, right up front, so that your homeowner is prepared, so they reserve dollars for it, and so they sequence that work so that the house that you just lavish time and attention on doesn't get ruined by the lack of a finished grade. Ah! Clean up. Um, when I walk onto a construction site, and I go on a lot of them, I keep steel toes in my trunk and a helmet in my trunk. Um, when I walk onto a site, that is clean. I know I'm on a site that's usually safe. And I'm very often on a site 
that's being built on schedule. There's that real correlation of time and safety that goes with clean. Don't let your owner talk you out of as much, as many dumpsters as you need, as much as you need to keep your site safe. I once worked on a, this, now this happened to be a commercial site. They, ran, they had an allowance, and the owner said, I don't want to go over the allowance for dumpsters. And they foolishly set a very small amount. You know, the owner was trying to get to budget. They plugged a, a fast number in for cleanup. And they ran out of their dumpster allowance, and so they filled, this is a five-story building, they filled the third story of this building with garbage. It was awful. It was awful. It was unsafe. It, it, this is not an area to compromise. This is an area you use to protect yourself. And you make sure that the owner understands that clean means safe. Miscellaneous and other. I always ask the owner, when I get all the way done, and I've gone through this now, I'm the second time, this is the final time, because the first time was the dry run. We made a bunch of adjustments as people saw things in the specs that needed fixing, or we clarified a bunch of things. Now I got the final version that I know I want you to sign. I always say, what else do you need to make this house your home? And I phrase it just like that. Because there'll be something that they want. And you don't necessarily know what that something is. I really would like it if I had a pull down stair to the attic in the garage. Now, that's not something that's in this spec book anyplace. But it's something that's in the owner's head that unless you asked an open-ended question, you wouldn't necessarily solicit. I want you to do that as part of the closure process that you have when you go through specifications. That's the better practice so that when they get done, they have a very clear vision, and it's a complete vision, of what it is you're going to build for them. That's the way that you have the shared expectation, the no surprises approach, so that the owner feels like they're getting real value for what you do. I can't tell you how many times in MBA arbitration I've had, uh, I've walked into, as an inspector, I've walked into a house that was beautiful, just gorgeous. And the maybe one or two items that are in dispute, a window that didn't sit right, something that, you know, there are a couple of things, but it completely detracts from that owner's appreciation of how good the rest of the house is. By setting an expectation of quality, by making clear what you get, by knowing the quality and watching out for the homeowner, so, you know, the homeowner is going, oh, i got to save some money. I want the cheapest vinyl windows we can get. Well, you know how those are going to perform, don't you? Those are not going to perform like the high-end custom windows. They're never going to be happy with that if the rest of the quality of the house is much higher than that. You need to speak up and say, look, we can do this, but I'm telling you, I don't think you're going to be happy with those. I know they don't perform as well. They're not as energy efficient. This is going to be your home for how many years? Two? No, this is, this is your home. This is where you're going to be. So I'd rather see you build a reasonable level of quality that is consistent with the rest of the house. And you use that dialogue that I just did you use that dialogue to talk about and set expectations. Then if they say, no, really, I want the vinyl. I can't afford the Pella architecturals. You go, all right, I, I will do what you're asking, but I just want you to understand. I think if, if you come, you know, we have a little bit of time before we order these. I want you to think about this. 
Come back in a couple of days. If you still want these, let's go for it. Give them that little chunk of time. In the remodeling contract in the state of Wisconsin, you've got three days to rescind. That's this very smart process for new construction, too. Give them a little time to let it sink in. They might not remember that pull down stair during the, dur during the construction. They, they might not remember it until they go through these specs again at home, one more time, looking at the plans, thinking about what they've got. Make sure it's as complete as possible, as objective as possible. Don't forget the seventh grader test. If a reasonably bright seventh grader can understand your specs, you've done a really good job. All right, if there are any other questions, I'm happy to take them. Go ahead. They chose the cheapest ones. If you really think it's going to be a problem, I would put it right in the contract. Yeah, I love email. Email is such a wonderful tool. You have a conversation with somebody. They make a selection. You say, just confirming our conference today, you've decided, you know, I, we talked about the vinyl and my concern that it's, it's a really a lesser quality compared to the whole rest of the house. But I understand you want to save money. Um, I'm just giving this you just one more chance. If you want to look at some alternates, I'll try and find some other things for you to look at. But if not, uh, if I don't hear from you in the next two days, we'll proceed with what you asked for. Now you've set up an expectation, and if they don't respond, that's like a last clear chance, and it's a nice dividing line for you. Okay? I love email. Yes? Oh, yes. And as you're going through all the options for people, there's nothing that you see they don't want. Right. In the lower school club, I want to get a window dress assignment. So lo and behold, by the time you get to the end, they got themselves a mini match and they only wanted it a match. Right. Or they only wanted a car. How do you deal with how do you deal with the homeowner who has a limited budget but lavish taste? That's a tough one. I think what, before getting all the way to the end of the specs with that person, uh, four or five lavish selections in, if not before then, you have to say, wow, some of the selections you're ma making are really eating up your budget fast. Let, let me look at, I want to skip some of these other sections and go to two or three of the high-end finishes. Uh, or stop altogether and say, I can tell already you're going to run out of your budget with some of the selections you're making. Let's prioritize. What are the half dozen things that are the most important to you? Let's work those in first and then work backwards to fill in the rest of my spec section. That's, a, that's one way that you can approach it. Um, the other thing is go all the way through, let them go through the sticker shock, and then say, all right, where can we trim? And that pulling it back is agonizing. All right, best of luck to all of you with your specifications, and uh, thank you for listening.